Yes, this takes me back uh, quite a long time. Actually, I'm speaking of my PhD thesis uh, many years ago, supervised by my professor, the late Nachman Avigad. And maybe the biggest surprise of myself was that uh, this subject, ritual bath, although it's a main institution in a Judaica institution in Jewish life and, and, and behavior from those days until this very day was never studied before from the archaeological and architectural uh, aspect. Not at all. I was simply the first. And I came to Avigad and said, Avigad, there's no works to cite. What should I do? He said, you'll find something, but I could not. So uh, I started from, from the beginning. And it started uh, in our digs in the Jewish quarter when we have excavated the private houses of the people of Jerusalem of the late Second Temple period, uh, that is the first century BC, the first century C, up to the destruction of the city, sacked by the Romans uh, in 70. And in those private houses uh, started to emerge a part of the rooms, the various rooms, uh, the cisterns, the bathrooms, the bathtubs, uh, the triclinia, the place, the dining room, etc. Also installations which were cut in bedrock and were plastered and had steps uh, of various sizes, like uh, the one that you can see here. And um, uh, suddenly it occurred to me, it was like a eureka uh, incident, that you say, maybe these are uh, mikvaot. And from that point on, uh, uh, I started to investigate the issue. And what I would like uh, you now to, uh, uh, to make you sort of experts to this uh, subject, at least that you'll be able to uh, build at home a kosher Jewish uh, uh, mikveh. <laughs> no, no, nothing to laugh about. Uh, when I started, we, we, we have found one after the other, and I can tell you that at the end of the dig in the Jewish quarter, which took about 12 years, I stayed with Avigat for about 10 years, uh, I have on record about in the various private houses, about 60 of them, 60. Uh, not all were found uh, perfectly preserved, but even half a mikveh is an indication that once at that particular point to the complete one. Then looking around in contemporary layers in other sites, like in Qumran, there is one mikveh that we see in the Khirbet Qumran on the Dead Sea uh, shore. You can see one of them. The picture, yes, I see it there. Or at Masada or at Herodium or in other sites. Uh, actually, they were there in various places. And um, they started to group, and a picture emerged out of it. At that time, uh, I had found on record, well, those 60 that Avigad has excavated were completely new. And actually, they enabled the, the study of the mikvaot. But the later ones were added. And to my first study uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, I could gather information on about 250, 60 or so of these installations all over the country. Plastered, st stepped in water installations, as simple as that. Today, uh, um, now everybody pays attention to it, and uh, I think I have on my record already over 550 of them. So practically, I, I cannot even uh, uh, track uh, uh, and trace all the, those which are found in various excavations and people just phoned me and said another one, another one, another one, another one. We have a really uh, uh, Israel-wide phenomenon. So some of these uh, uh, sentences are just uh, uh, reminders or uh, uh, points to, to speak of. Um, the mikveh well, you can read by yourself, is indeed an archi architectural entity, but it is also mentioned uh, numerously in the rabbinic uh, literature, 
particularly in the Mishnah and Tosefta, which originate, part of, of it at least, in the days which we are speaking of. There's even a special tractate among those tractates comprising the Mishnah and the Tosefta, which is called Mikvaot, which is Mikve in the plural. Um, only do me a favor and write Mikve with a W and not with a V, because it's originally written with a Vav. But this is... Um, how to identify a mikveh? This was my main problem at the beginning. Those, mikvaot, those tractates, mikvaot, in the Mishnah and Tosefta are not manuals uh, which uh, um, guide those who wish to build such an uh, installation how to do it. Dig uh, two by four meters, etc. You know, like a manual. Not at all. But they are, as it's written, compilations of solved problems which emerge from those installations. And usually, not the mikveh was the problem, but the water was the problem, which is contained in it. And in a moment, I will uh, uh, make you expert on this. The mikveh is just an installation, a man-made man installation, which is meant to give a person who seeks purity, ritual purity, to obtain it by taking a complete uh, immersion in the waters contained in it. Uh, to take a tevila, that is a full immersion of the body uh, um, in it. Just entering the water and coming out. No cleaning, no washing, no taking off dirt. It is meant to, uh, to obtain ritual purity, which is something symbolic, something which is, uh, uh, well, let's say, embedded in the nature of this installation. That it is built according to several, to particular qualifications. It meets particular qualifications and is not just a cistern or a bathtub or just any container of water. And it goes back to the biblical, to the biblical uh, uh, scripture. I just brought one, one or two of those uh, uh, laws or regulations um, stated in the book of Leviticus. Verachatz, for those who read it in Hebrew, Verachatz b'mayim et kol besaro v'tameh ad ha'erev. And you have there the English uh, uh, translation. So if somebody uh, suffered from any kind of, let's say, skin disease and was cured and the priest has uh, confirmed that he is now uh, healthy again, then this is entire regulation and it repeats itself several times. When later in the Second Temple period the rabbinic authorities uh, 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 decided to elaborate on this, they had to say what does it mean, verachatz? What does it mean, maim? What is, that is, verachatz? What does it mean, he washed? What is this washing? What is maim? Any uh, uh, idea of um, quantity, of quality, of where it is to be held, etc. What is kol besaro, his entire flesh or entire body, right? Uh, etc. So they have elaborated on this uh, passage and the others which are very similar are actually identical except of one case uh, in which it is called Verachatz Bemaim. I think I have it, just a moment. Yes, this is another case. Verachatz Besaro Bemaim Chayim Vetaher. Said only once. Uh, and bathe his flesh in. R here the translation is running water, but Maim Chayim is living water, actually, and we'll see later what it means. But usually it's not living water. The mikveh, which was later invented on the basis of these um, uh, passages, did not require living water, just water. So uh, um, those who um, were the religious authorities in the late Second Temple period, and I can even say more or less from the middle of the 
or from the late second century BC and onwards, because the earliest installations of this type date back, dated archaeologically, of course, to this particular time, let's say from the days of the Hasmoneans and onwards, uh, we start to find these installations. Here is uh, things which you can see today underground in a basement of what is called the Herodian Mansion, but you can see here these installations which are part, or this part which is part of, a, of an underground, of a basement in which one bathroom with two bathtubs and two mikvaot, one is outside of the picture and one is just this many standing here at the entrance of it, you see it a little bit closer, at least the bathtub, the very small bathtubs you can see over here, the wall of it is destroyed but you can see or reconstruct it as it was originally and the other one is a sitting bath, you can see even the step inside plastered with the grayish, very typical plaster inside. These are bathtubs, a place where you barely can sit inside and really wash yourself, take off the dirt with water brought to you by a certain helper assistant who pours water on you, drawn from the nearby cistern. Whereas this entrance leads into, uh, or these, uh, this entrance lead into an installation of this type, or the one that we've seen before at the beginning, but here's just another one. Uh, 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 well, myself sitting here, I was a little bit thicker, but... Uh, and the hair was a little bit darker and anyway you can see a water installation with plastered walls steps leading down, there are more steps, I mean the photographer stood inside and, and took the picture outwards and here the entire ceiling did preserve in situ and the ceiling is not plastered as you can see the vault here only the lower part because the mikveh had to hold the water the entire year around here are just a few uh, uh, instances of these mikvaot. These are three or four others. And you already will notice that they are in different shapes. The only thing which is common to all, that they have steps and that they are plastered. Right? You can see here the different steps leading down. These are completely different. And here is even a stone inserted into this cemented ground because this step is a little bit too high to overcome, especially when you go out. This is uh, more or less uh, the mikveh that we have seen before, this one. You can see here the, the cross section of it, and note that occasionally we have in mikvah a wide step midway, or if it's even deeper, uh, uh, there are two wide steps, I'll talk about it in a moment. Another thing that you can see is just by counting, there's no fixed number to the steps, right? Uh, the amikvaot with three steps and the amikvaot with 15 steps and all the spectrum in between has nothing to do with the mikveh, nothing at all. So um, I more or less uh, realized that ritual cleansing or purifying was carried out before uh, men have invented the mikveh. This is a man-made thing. I mean, up to a certain point there were no mikvot and from a certain point somebody invented them. And they were invented simply to meet probably the large demand and the ever-growing demand for purifying uh, uh, installations. Up to that time people could use the spring of Gihon. Uh, and this was even before the constructing of the Pool of Siloam. At that time I didn't know even that one day I'll find it. Uh, uh, um, so uh, uh, I can imagine that people in those early days, let's say before the middle, the middle of the second century BC, they used the spring of Gihon, the only spring in Jerusalem. And I can imagine that the line started to become longer and longer because the popula population of Jerusalem grew steadily on one side. And also the religious code developed, elaborated. More requirements were uh, 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 set on the people saying for this also you have to be pure and for that also you have to be pure. And so if you uh, uh, demand more uh, uh, from the people, they need more 
to take ritual bath for, for this or that. And so the mikveh was, was um, invented. Um, the invention is, not, there's nothing said about it in, in, in the rabbinic writings at all. We have only a faint echo from those days. Probably the early, the early installations were called me'ara, cave, simply cave. And probably the first mikvaot were simply natural caves which were uh, made into uh, um, uh, mikvaot were provided, let's say, with steps. Usually caves don't have steps or plastered all around. And only later, and then we have this term in the rabbinic writings, me'ara, or cave. But later we hear only of mikveh or beit tvila, the house of immersion. Uh, of course, those who, again, the rabbinic authorities had to be very precise when they had regulated those very few regulations with, which uh, uh, requ are required for a water installation to be a mikveh. And uh, uh, they had to be very sp specific, particularly anything con uh, concerning volume, right? Because you could say, they could say, well, let's do it uh, very large, and, uh, 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 but this would not be... Uh, um, this would have been um, a demand that the people would not be able to meet to gather such an amount of water. So the mikveh uh, uh, eventually is um, um, a water installation which meets several regulations. We'll uh, uh, go into details in a moment. And uh, uh, they are, I think they thought very carefully on this, on those minimum requirements, not to make them uh, unfeasible, I mean, impossible to obtain in relation to the climate and to the fact that only in the winter we have rains here, not a single drop in the summer. Just look outside how hot it is today. Uh, I leave springs aside. We are speaking now on the mikvaot, which are uh, uh, making use of rainwater, particularly those of Jerusalem but also in other places, those which make use of spring water are also there, especially in Jericho, or on uh, flood water. There's only one case, and these are the mikvaot of Qumran. But we'll speak on those abundant ones from Jerusalem. Five requirements make the water in, a, in, a, in such a container, in such a, not containers, in such an installation, uh, uh, different from the waters which are contained in a cistern. These are the same waters from the same rainstorm, exactly the same, H2O also chemically just the same. And yet they are totally different because they were obtained differently and uh, uh, they meet some demands. And if these demands were met, the water inside, everybody knows where gathered for this particular purpose, to uh, uh, give the possibility for people to, to take a ritual bath and uh, uh, obtain purity. The main, the main uh, 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 maybe the main requirement is the second one written here. The waters had to be bidei shamayim, in the hands of heaven. Well, water, the rain comes from the heaven, not this is what is meant, but that they are not gathered in the, in the installation with the help of men. That means that they gathered inside by themselves, by gravity, actually. Right? You cannot draw water from a cistern and pour them into that installation and say, here you have a have waters where you can use for ritual uh, purification. Impossible. Drawn water, although might be very clean and cool and, and uh, nice to drink, but will not qualify for ritual purification because man has intervened. As simple as that. So Bidei Shamai means the water gathered by themselves. Also spring water, which comes out from the ground, emanates from the ground, are also in the hands of heaven. I mean, 
This is anything natural is, of course, in the hands of heaven. Or if it's groundwater, all the mikvaot in medieval Europe, in the Jewish communities of medieval Europe, and if, I think I've seen all of them, are based on groundwater. Right? Here, almost none of them. Uh, and even flood water is in the hands of heaven, if you like. So this requirement is basic, is, is uh, uh, maybe the main one, in the hands of heaven. So drawn water from a cistern will not qualify because a man has intervened. That means that water which crossed on the way to the mikveh in a container, in a vessel, will also not, will, will disqualify the mikveh because a vessel is used to draw water and if by mistake, let's say the pipe went through a bucket uh, which is a container, then it will disqualify, it depends also on volume, but let's make it simple here, it will disqualify because it made use, so to speak, of the vessel and not in the hands of heaven anymore. Um, this brings us to what is written here first, connected to the ground. Mechubar la karka or la sela. This means that a mikveh has to be connected to the ground, either cut in the ground, in the rock, or even built into the earth, but built stone by stone and plastered. It is not possible to, um, to bring a bathtub like we use today, right? and a precast ba bathtub and insert it into the ground. Because then we have a vessel, a very large vessel, which usually might be used to draw water. And the, the symbolic value of, the, of this installation, whatever it is called, now it's not a mikveh, is, is gone because a vessel is, is uh, uh, incorporated in it. Uh, this is it. In what, what uh, uh, concerns the mikveh itself. Pay attention, I haven't spoken of shape, I haven't spoken of steps. Then uh, they have uh, regulated a minimal volume to the mikveh, 40 se'a. I'm not sure what stands behind the figure 40, which is a typolog typological figure, and what stands behind Se'ah? Because Se'ah in Old Testament times was a measure for dry uh, commodities, not for liquids. Uh, but there is probably some, some uh, um, symbolic value in this combination. I have to remind you that in the Solomonic Temple, uh, as written in the, in the, the Old Testament, was standing the yam or the sea, the molten sea. Uh, if this one would have been taken, the figure re related to it, to, to make the mikvaot as large as this, I think nobody would have been able to construct a mikveh because it was very large and probably uh, uh, the entire winter storms of a particular house would not be sufficient to fill in the water in it. On the other, other hand, there are mentioned several smaller uh, basins which contain 40 but, not 40 CA, and maybe the figure 40 comes from there, because 40, as you know, is a, is a symbolic, is a figure with symbolic value. But on this, I'm not totally sure. Anyway, it's a strange figure, but 40 CA would be, let's say, we don't know exactly how much it was, but let's say, according to the various calculations, somewhere, around one cubic meter or cubic yard, let's say, right? Not much, not much, but enough. If it is concentrated for a person to enter it, step down the steps, it will uh, cover him up to the waist or so and then uh, uh, simply crouch into the waters and, and cover himself or herself with water and complete the ritual, uh, uh, the tevila, the ritual bathing. So minimal volume, minimal volume 40 CA. Of course, I could pour 40 CA in this room and nobody would be able to take a ritual bath. Then they also added that it had to be on a very limited 
space of amma al amma al shalosh amot, a cubit by cubit by three cubits deep. And these are the two figures which give us the minimum, minimal values, minimum values for the, for the volume and, and, and the shape of the volume. It's, that doesn't say that the amikve has to be a, a cubit in, in a shape of, of a prism of one cubit by one cubit by three cubits, right? This is the minimum. This is the, let's call it the red line. Can be larger, cannot be smaller. And finally, tightly plastered, so that the waters inside will not, as the Mishnah calls it, be uh, in a state of zochalin, creeping water. That is, that the water have to, that the installation has to be plastered and replastered occasionally every year if there are cracks or if the plaster is damaged, so that there will. It will be, uh, they will be assured that the water is holding in this, in, in this installation around the entire year. This is it. No steps, no shape, as I said, because this is usually what bothers and worries people, right? And there are, believe me, mikvaot of various uh, shapes. And uh, uh, no steps are required, although there's no mikveh which has no steps at all. Actually, you could take a ritual bath also in a cistern. It is connected to the ground. It receives its uh, waters uh, by gravity from the courtyard and from the roof, has the volume, has the depth, is plastered occasionally, and yet it is not used as a mikveh because nobody can enter it, uh, let alone come out of it, of a system which has usually a very deep and without any steps to use uh, uh, to come out of it. So how would you use it? In principle, you could use a cistern to take a ritual bath, but then you have to drink the water, you know. <laughs> like the famous joke. Yeah, uh, but... So... Um, this is, this is uh, let's say, this is uh, the basics, right? And uh, we have these installations all over the country in uh, the specific layers, in the specific sites, which we know for sure were inhabited by Jews. And then there are some variations on the mikvaot, different ones. I don't ha know if I'll have the time to enter all the issues on mikvaot, well, I, I won't have. This is for sure, but at least let's see a few other examples. So we have mikvaot with a divided path. That's the famous mikveh vis-a-vis the western wall of the Temple Mount. It's the easiest one to, to, to visit, actually, when you enter the park, the archaeological park, and the Herodian Street. Don't miss it, of course. Uh, um, this is one of many mikvaot around uh, the Temple Mount. Uh, most of them were excavated by Benjamin Mazar before me. There are about remains of 30, 40 of them, all, all, only there, that corner. And you can see that this mikveh has a divided path, cut from bedrock. And this is not even the bottom of the mikveh. It enters, further enters into it. And you can see the, the, the Robinson's Arch over here and the western wall of the Temple Mount. Um, I noticed this was my, actually my first article ever written, I think 1879 or so. <laughs> oh, yeah, many years. Yeah, my scientific article, it's nothing to, I'm very proud of it. And I realized that, that uh, uh, we have about 25%, about, no, no, excuse me, no, less, 25 mikvaot, not, about 10%, 15% of the mikvaot have one of two phenomena, or both of them. Either a divided path in two, or two openings reaching to the same mikveh, right? Two openings, one next to the other, and when you enter one, you've seen that you could actually have used the other one as well. They reach to the same to the same um, room or, or, or installation. 
And uh, uh, this was a very nice example where uh, Talmudists, those who, uh, scholars of the Talmud on one side, they don't bother much on archaeological findings, as well as we, the archaeologists, don't read too much uh, uh, the text of the Talmud and the Mishnah and Talmud, etc. But when you do it, you suddenly see, uh, uh, you have many insights into, into phenomena that nobody has paid attention to. Uh, and then just one verse from the Mishnah tractate Shkalim, not even in Mikvaot. And you can see this translation from the Hebrew, uh, which speaks on vessels uh, in a ritual bath. Also vessels had to be purified occasionally. And it speaks on uh, finding vessels you could find on the way down to the Mikveh or on the way up from the Mikveh descending or ascending, this still can be the same lane, the same path, right? And yet when we read at the bottom, their descending path is not similar to their ascending path. From this you can see very clearly that at least that mikveh had two lanes. And uh, uh, this could not be anything else than this because there are no other possibilities, either with two openings or with a, division, a divided path, or with both uh, uh, elements. So uh, the only thing that I don't know is uh, uh, which lane was used for descending and which was used for ascending. Because ritual impurity, tum'a, ritual impurity, was an entity transmitted by touch. It's not dirt, right? Uh, sources of impurity might be various. Somebody uh, coming back from the cemetery is impure by definition, not by, he, he doesn't even have to touch the dead. Uh, somebody touching an insect becomes impure. A woman after childbirth is impure, etc., etc. So uh, um, uh, these persons, if they wanted, for example, to enter the Temple Mount, had to. This was a requirement to take a ritual bath and become pure. And this could be obtained only by taking a ritual bath in the mikveh. Now, if such a person entered the mikveh and somebody came out and he touched before he took the ritual bath, the man who came just out, that poor fella had to do it again because he became uh, 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 impure again. Nothing wrong with his clean appearance, but it was impure uh, again, and so on. So we find them, not in all the mikvaot. Um, as I said, um, I have today on my list about 30 of them or so, right? So uh, 30 out of 500 and something will give you more or less the, the percentage of these. There were, this was particularly required near the Temple Mount, where a, 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 um, a long line of people were waiting to enter the mikveh one after the other to take a ritual bath. Well, this we have seen. And now I'll take you just to one or two or three places just to show you that these installations are found in other places as well. Gamla in the Golan, this uh, uh, contemporary Golanite city uh, built on the slope, on a steep slope of, the, of, uh, of a mountain, uh, was also one of the sites which rebelled against Rome and was destroyed by Rome, by the Roman uh, army. Excavations there by now have uh, found four or five mikvaot. Or maybe I should say before, uh, one problem is of course the problem of identification. So you had, uh, uh, I gave you the regulations, what meets, uh, 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 what meets the regu uh, the, these regulations can be uh, a mikveh. But we have also to remember that there are other installations in all these private houses. There are cisterns just next to it. There are bathtubs and all kinds of other installations which have no steps or are very small or, or medium size, etc. These are, of course, not mikvaot uh, because they do not meet these requirements. 
Here's just one of the mikvaot of Gamla while being excavated. You can see here the steps are uh, located on the side. This is different than the type of Jerusalem. This is more the type of Jericho. Although uh, this mikveh obtained rainwater and not spring water. Well, anyway, you can see the, uh, the um, plaster and replastered, how this installation was plastered and replastered. And uh, people just entered, took a ritual bath, and came out. All what you find inside here is, of course, whatever fell down or collapsed down from the upper floor has nothing to do with uh, uh, this place. Because these installations are in, in the basement, uh, they are usually find, found with uh, all kinds of what we call goodies inside. <laughs> anyway, uh, a, another requirement, also not, not uh, uh, written at all, uh, but uh, is simply um, evident from what we find is that all these installations are found in basements. Uh, very simply because uh, they tried to avoid light. Light is bad for waters because uh, photosynthesis will uh, develop algae and it will become green, etc. And which still qualifies, by the way, for taking a ritual uh, bath, but is disgusting. Uh, 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 because uh, I have to uh, uh, say just another thing, another requirement, which is uh, also written, which has nothing to do to the mikveh itself, but relates to the waters inside it. The moment that this installation, which meets those requirements which I uh, pointed to, are gathered in this installation, they can purify uh, impure persons, except with some exceptions, impure vessels with some exceptions. For example, pottery vessels cannot be purified. They can also purify water. Un uh, impure water may be when you add to the mikveh the added water in those days were purified instantly, provided that the uh, minimal required volume of the mikveh, of 40 se'a, was still there in the installation. So any addition will be purified instantly. This change, by the way, today mikvaot, by, used by those who seek uh, ritual purity today, uh, are based on, the, there, were, there were some changes which occurred in, in uh, the rabbinic regulations concerning mikvaot in the last 2,000 years, right? But we have to judge them according to the regulations of those days. So the waters had to be there in the basement. We can see it in the Gamla. Uh, uh, um, I think there's another one. No. In the Gamla uh, installation. The waters in the installation, in the mikveh, uh, uh, were uh, qualified or, or, or were um, able to purify persons, etc., as long as they looked like waters, had the natural appearance of waters. This may seem strange, what might happen to waters. For example, if algae developed inside, this is natural. Uh, this still qualifies. Or flood waters, like in Qumran, coming uh, with, uh, with, uh, from, the val from the Vadi into the installations there has this light brown uh, color of water because of the silt which is uh, uh, carried by the waters of the flood. This is the natural appearance of water. Give it the time required. After two weeks, the mud will settle down and the water will, will become uh, clear, right? This is natural, no problem. What is not natural is that if somebody, and, and these are those discussions in the Mishnah, what happens if, for example, a jar of oil breaks and the oil runs into the mikveh, or a jar of wine breaks and runs into the mikveh, or a jar of milk breaks and, and, and runs into the mikveh. What would you say? This brownish, uh, 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 muddy uh, water, would you take their ritual bath or in waters which have a little bit oil on top of them? 
you might probably take the oil thing, right? But this is disqualified because this is not natural appearance of water. So water might be disqualified not by the mikveh but by their appearance or wine, right? Maybe everybody would say, ah, a little bit of wine. Uh, uh, in, 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 uh, mixed in the, so the waters are a little bit rosy or so. This is not good. And I ask myself, why bother? I mean, why this discussion seems so academic? What happens if a jar of oil breaks into the mikveh? Is this, uh, uh, this is probably very rare. Why bring it as a discussion? But it is not. This was probably very common because uh, mikvaot are found in many places which were used as farmsteads, farms, near oil presses, wine presses, that is in the countryside. And they were there and this situation of oil or wine or any other uh, liquid which, does not, which is not water running into a, a, a full mikveh is not an academic question. This probably happened or was a hazard to the, to, the, to the mikveh and this is the reason why they discuss it. Otherwise, uh, uh, th this would not have been even risen, uh, uh, brought to the um, rabbis to say, hey, what do we do with this? So Jericho. I just bring one out of maybe 35 mikvaot found there in the Hasmonean and in the Herodian palaces. These are the earliest ones of the mikvaot because Jericho, eh, 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 Hasmonean Jericho, not, not Neolithic Jericho, eh, I mean, eh, eh, was excavated in, in the last generation by Ehud Netzer. Greater parts of this site are now also published information. And we find these installations uh, um, there. You can see the mikveh itself is this part with a narrow staircase on the side, right? Uh, you see it's very spacey and, and, and you can see here the person standing here and they usually have an additional uh, uh, container or uh, installation without steps but connected with various uh, channels to this one. So this place was fed by, what, by spring water coming from the main aqueduct which crossed the site. Uh, water coming in, surplus coming out. The same with this installation, in and out. And in between a connection could be obtained to connect this one with this one. Not to fill it through this, but simply to connect the waters. If these two installations are full, up to the rim, then a slight uh, uh, watery connection here makes un unifies them together. One body of water. This is like the ones in Jerusalem, which have some of them have a parted path, which is, a, let's call it a Jerusalem type of mikveh or subtype of mikveh. This is a Jericho type of mikveh. And this brings us to, again back to this like axiom which I formulated a moment ago. If an installation meets those five requirements, that is connected with the ground by hands of heaven, uh, volume, depth, plastered, and the waters look like uh, water, these water have the, the, the ability, capacity, to purify impure persons, impure vessels, with some exceptions, and impure water. That means that one can add water to it. And this stands behind uh, this strange uh, situation, of which is very typical to Jericho, and almost not non-existent in Jerusalem, for example that these were built in pairs. Actually, these are two mikvaot. One uh, gives people the ability to enter and get out, take a ritual bath. The other one is inaccessible. I mean, uh, you will not jump into it or so, or else you, 
might have difficulties to come out. But it's a mikve. It has all, it meets all the requirements said before. Now, uh, what is meant here probably, and this was later uh, replicated in Masada and other places, is that the waters standing in this installation the entire year, with time, become stale, become dirty, become whatever. It's especially in a dry climate like in Jericho, etc. Or even if the aqueduct there is broken for a few months, what do we do? So uh, uh, at the beginning of the winter, both parts, both mikvaot actually, were filled with water, which qualified as mikvaot. This was constantly used. This one was there on the side as a storage, if you like. Later, not in the second temple period, but later, Jews will call it the otsar. Otsar means not treasury, but otsar means simply a magazine, a, a, a place to, to, to hold things in it. So um, when uh, uh, at the beginning of the winter these were filled in with water, and later these became dirty, stale, stinking, who knows, they could have been bucketed out, there's no uh, opening at the bottom as we are used today. Uh, cannot be, by the way, by definition, but n never mind now. Were taken out, cleaned, filled in with new waters which were drawn from a nearby cistern, let's say. These do not qualify yet because they are drawn water. They are not in the hands of heaven, right? All the other uh, uh, elements uh, they meet all the other uh, requirements, but not the hands of heaven, uh, so to speak, because they are drawn from a cistern, let's say. At that particular time, the, the, the stopper, which closed here the, the passage between this installation, which was lying there full all the winter, all the summer round, nobody touched it, nobody took a ritual bath in it, anything, was opened, and the waters here were brought into contact. Nothing had to flow, just contact for a brief moment. And then, actually, what happened here is the waters here turned into one body of water, right? One body of water. Looks like an eight or so, right? One body of water. So, actually, if you go to that axiom which I have formulated before, these water instantly will purify any amount of additional water which meets all the other uh, requirements. So you could later re continue and use again fresh, uh, uh, fresh and, 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 and clean waters and repeat this process again and again. Mik Masada has such mikvaot, also Jericho, and uh, there's one like this in Jerusalem also. Uh, here, Masada, just an example there are about. Uh, uh, Yadin has published this mikveh from Masada, and another one is also mentioned in his writings, but there are about 18 of them all around, right? Particularly built, uh, some of them by, in, the, in the Herodian palaces, and most of them built by those Sikari, the, the, the zealots who took refuge in the place after fleeing from Jerusalem. This is one, that's the more famous one, and you can see here the... Uh, the mikveh itself, and uh, here enters the water which was gathered from the plateau of Masada, or maybe of the roofs of the buildings there. And believe me, I was once at Masada when a heavy rainstorm was there, and if I had just uh, a pick, a small pick with me, I could have cleaned here, opened this, and this would have been filled in a few minutes. Here you have this, what later would be called Otsar. If you like to call it already in this period, Otsar, it's also okay, although this name does not appear in these days. And you can see the repeated plastering of these installations, uh, uh, um, one next to the other. Or another uh, installation in Masada, which Yadin called, the excavator of, of Masada, the swimming pool. This is no swimming pool today, we know it. This is a large mikveh. This is a large mikveh. And um, uh, I must say that uh, uh, I have other indications. 
some other lecture, some other time, that in the building behind it, number 12 and number 11, uh, of Masada uh, was where the, where the um, quarters where the people who fled from Qumran took refuge. So the people of Masada, those uh, zealots or Sikari who found uh, refuge there, about a thousand people there, were not uniform in, in their origin from where they came. Uh, all of them were Jews, of course, but there were those who came from Jerusalem and those who came from Qumran. And, and some uh, uh, scriptures, uh, remains of, of, of uh, sectarian scriptures were found in Masada as well. So there's no surprise actually to find a large uh, mikveh, uh, let's say of the size which is very typical to the mikvot of Qumran, which are the largest in, in the entire corpus of mikvaot. In Qumran, there's a reason why they are big because they gathered flood waters, and uh, these contained large amounts of mud, which had to settle and then uh, occupy the lower part of, of these installations. Some observations and conclusions. The only architectural element which identifies a Jewish house, a Jewish uh, uh, village, etc. Of course, also synagogues, but how many synagogues do we have of the Second Temple period? A handful. And Mikvaot, as I said, over 500. This is a real difference. Uh, I mean, uh, there are also other signs which identify Jewish, um, Jewish um, settlements and houses, but they are objects uh, which might move around, whereas a Mikveh is something connected to the ground. They are found in those areas which we knew beforehand that they were settled by Jews, like Jerusalem, Masada, Jericho, Qumran, Yotafata, etc., Sepphoris, etc. They are absent, totally absent, in all the Hellenistic towns, which we know of, many of them excavated, for example, all those along the Mediterranean coast. If I start with Tyre and Acre, and, 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 and Ashkelon, and Ashdod, and Joppa, and other places. They appear, there's one mikveh in Caesarea Maritima, which was a Roman city, but we know of, uh, we know of a Jewish uh, community there, a Jewish neighborhood there. So this is not so surprising, or maybe it's, it is surprising. So um, uh, the mikveh is today the number one uh, denominator or identifier of, of Jewish uh, a presence, uh, I mean, an archaeological mean to do it. Uh, as I said, also in mixed places. And um, uh, they are also, on the other side, they are absent in Jewish, um, in Jewish settlements uh, which are along the Sea of Galilee. There were none found in Capernaum, none found in Magdala, none found in Tiberias or other places because they were not uh, required there. The, the Sea of Galilee is actually considered a large, uh, uh, a large mikveh and this is maybe the reason why they are not found over there. Uh, so as you can see, it exclusively characterizes the Jewish house and the Jewish settlement. Uh, things which I have already said before. And it is in constant use from the second century BC till this very date, uninterruptedly. And um, um, these installations are, as I said, found now in large numbers almost in every excavation in, in, um, in Judea or in Galilee, right? And they are totally absent in other areas where we know no Jews were living over there. Thank you. Thank you.